Welcome to our webinar, presented by Contact Healthcare. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jacqueline Detter, and I serve as the Director of Marketing at Contech. As a benefit to our customers, Contech assists compounding pharmacies in the development of best practices, training, and education with guidance from USP standards to prevent harm. We are pleased to bring you today's program which will include navigating critical changes based on the USP standards that were just published on November 1st. But first, I want to thank the nearly 1,500 of you that registered for the event today. In the spirit of 797, we wanted to give away this book, Killshot, autographed by author Jason Deeren to our 797th registrant. And that person is Joanna, Director of Pharmacy at Baptist Memorial Hospital. Congratulations, we will be in touch to get this book to you soon. Today's program will begin with Context Clinical Support Manager, Michael Myers, followed by a panel of experts who will be addressing some of your questions. Michael has been with Context since 1998, working in various roles. In the last decade, he has been exclusively focused on helping sterile compounding by developing educational materials in the in-service teaching of pharmacy technicians, helping them become compliant with USP chapters 797 and 800. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to you, Michael. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. And I wanna thank everyone out there today who has joined us as we're gonna walk through some of the key changes in this new chapter, specifically sort of on these four broad umbrellas or tents dealing with key changes in hand hygiene and garbing, 
We're also going to talk about introducing items into the PEC and SEC, cleaning and disinfecting, and personnel training. But just to get some of the housekeeping out of the way, this chapter was published last week on November the 1st of 2022. And they've given us an, a go official date of November the 1st, 2023. Interestingly, USP usually gives about a year or excuse me, a six month window before a chapter becomes official. But in this case, um, they're giving us an entire year. So until November 1st of 2023. We've got a neat feature that we can use on this hop-in polling platform. So right now, a poll is going to be popping up on your screen. And we want to ask you, how, do, how soon do you plan on implementing these changes in your facility? Are you planning to do this immediately? Are you giving yourself a, a three-month window, maybe a six-month window? Or are you just sort of giving yourself that one date of number of the first 2023? One interesting thing to note here is about USP 800. Now, while that chapter has been official for several years, it was never compendably applicable. Because of USP bylaws, a chapter has to be referenced in another chapter that's numbered beneath 1,000. And when the 2019 version of Chapter 797 got remanded and sent back to the CEC, that left 800 in this sort of state of limbo where it was official but not compendably applicable. So when that official date happens for Chapter 797, it, the same thing will happen with 8, 800. It will become official and applicable. I'm going to go into our studio here, Daniel, in our control room. Have you got any of those poll results for us? Yes, poll results are still coming in, but right now the leader is three to six months with 56% of the vote, followed by within three months with 24% of the vote, 10% uh, of the vote for immediately, and 7% of the vote waiting until November 1st. Got you. So I actually find that pretty interesting that most of the folks are putting themselves in that three to six month window where we would ordinarily sort of have that normal enforcement window. So thank you for taking the time to answer that question. I want to point out that today's presentation really is focused on those four arrows. It's a narrow focus. Today we're only going to be talking about some of the changes when it comes to cleaning and disinfecting, hand hygiene and garbing, personnel training, and then movement of materials into the PEC and the SEC. Obviously, there's a lot of other stuff in this chapter that you're going to need to become familiar with and become compliant with. So please make sure you read the entire chapter. I want to start off by defining drug categories. We're not going to really get into the weeds in this webinar about beyond you stating, but I do need to sort of define what these new categories are because later in this presentation, when we talk about some of the garbing or the cleaning requirements, there are some differences when it comes to the folks that are doing category one and two versus the folks that will be doing category three compounding. The first is category one. This has the least sort of environmental control. So this might be compounding in an SCA. And so that's going to sort of give you a very limited beyond use dating. Category two is really what most, I would imagine most of the folks in this audience are familiar with doing. So it's patient specific compounding, 503A compounding, and you know, one prescription for one patient. This is going to be done in a clean room space in a classified environment. So with these additional controls in place, you're allowed to have a longer beyond use date. So this sort of is where what were considered sort of the low or the medium categories from our previous chapter. The new thing with this chapter are the category three. Definitely will be considered those high risk. When you move on to category three drugs, you are allowed to have longer beyond use dates but it comes with lots of extra conditions that you're going to have to meet. This includes sterility testing. You're going to have to do more environmental monitoring. Sterile garb is going to be required. You're going to have to have increased use of sporicidals. So the impact of going to category three is going to be significant. We're going to have another poll question pop up on your screen right now. I'm just curious, how many of you anticipate or know that you will be doing any category three compounding? Most of the folks in this audience are going to be sort of at that category two level. And then if any of you have an SCA, and we'll talk about some of the cleaning requirements for an SCA later in this uh, uh, webinar, are going to be focused on category one. So Daniel, I'll flash over to you in the clean uh, control room. I know some of our, our uh, questions, answers are still coming in. I'll allow our audience at home to get a sneak peek of, of ground control. We're able to produce and bring this webinar to you. 
But what are we getting on some of the poll questions here, Daniel? Yeah, so right now the poll results are uh, the answer yes has 12%. The answer no, 80%. And about 7% are unsure at the moment. So that fits sort of right in where I thought that this target audience was. We're category two compounders. Category three might be some of those community pharmacies that are really looking for longer beyond use dating. Um, but in these acute care settings, you're really going to be primarily category two. So now let's really jump in. We understand category one, two, and three. Let's jump into what the chapter actually says. So section two, we'll start at the beginning with personnel training and evaluation. The first thing you need to do is assign a designated person, and they, they use the abbreviation DP throughout the chapter. So this designated person is going to be responsible for designing and creating that training plan and also implementing that training plan. The designated person doesn't always have to conduct all of the training. The chapter says that the training can be done by an assigned trainer. So you could bring in an outside expert to help train your staff or even sort of a, you know, a train the trainer scenario in your facility. And that person then could train all that. But that program must be created and documented by that designated person. The chapter really is looking at training requirements into sort of two groups of grouping people into two groups based on their job function. The first is really the most prescriptive and that has to deal with people who compound and those who have direct oversight over people who compound. And the second group of folks are folks that are, are performing restocking duties or any sort of the general cleaning and disinfecting. Again, with our narrow focus today, I'm not gonna get into some of the uh, uh, I'll call them compounding uh, requirements that are used for that first group of people. So the people that compound or oversee compounding are going to have uh, prescriptive requirements for doing their glove fingertip testing, doing their media field testing. We're really more focused on sort of the garbing training and the cleaning and disinfecting training. And that fits into that second group of folks of those who restock or clean. And quite honestly, in the chapter, it's a little bit less prescriptive it really leaves it up to the facility. And basically it says that you need to define an SOP and that those folks that are involved in those duties, cleaning and restocking, must be trained according to that SOP. So they're certainly a little less prescriptive than we saw in the 2021 20, proposed chapter and certainly more so in the 2000, 2008 chapter. Um, first, you need to demonstrate knowledge and competency of skills for sterile compounding. So I'm not going to read through this entire par paragraph for you, but basically it says any person that's going to prepare, that's going to be involved in the act of compounding must be able to demonstrate the knowledge and their competency of skills for sterile compounding, you know, the manipulations they need to make, as well as maintaining the, uh, the, the environment that they're in. So they've got to have that training at the beginning. You know, it's not only knowing it up here, but being able to demonstrate that they're able to reproduce those skills. I often use the analogy when we were all you know, 15 or 16, depending on the state you grew up in, and got our driver's license. First, we had to go and pass the written test, and then we had to go and pass the, pass the driver's test. So as you, the DP, are responsible for implementing these training programs, there should be a written aspect of that test so that people show you that they know it up in their head, but there also needs to be a demonstration phase where they actually are showing you that they know how to apply those skills. The chapter says that these folks must be trained at least every 12 months. And again, we're going to sort of focus on today on hand hygiene, garbing, cleaning and disinfecting, and then the principles, how you move materials in and out of the clean room. When you get into the chapter, there's a lot of other bullet points here that people are going to be responsible for. So make sure you read the, the entire chapter rather than the, the four things we're focused on here today. When you're entering a space, category one, category two, category three, it doesn't matter. The chapter is pretty clear that all personnel who enter a compounding area where category one, two, or three drugs are made need to be trained on proper hand hygiene and proper garbing. So that applies to everyone, whether they're making the drugs or just coming in there perhaps to clean the room or restock the room. You know, this list that I'm going to run through right here probably looks familiar to a lot of you because a lot of these bullet points were embedded in parts of the 2008 chapter. They didn't sort of break out these core competencies. They were embedded in other paragraphs. But a lot of these bullet points were in that 2019 proposal, so you'll be familiar with it. But at this, this section right here, 3.1, deals with sort of how 
they want you to show up for work. And first of all, you need to remove any personal or outer garments before you show up. You need to have no cosmetics. There's no jewelry or uh, jewel, jewelry allowed. This is a new one. No earbuds or headphones. I don't think earbuds existed in 2008 when the chapter first came out. Make sure. So they're basically saying no electronic devices other than ones you need to do your job can be taken into that compounding space. You'll actually have to separate yourself from your, your phone for a few minutes to go in there and compound that medication. You obviously have to keep your nails neatly trimmed. That can interfere with the effectiveness of your gloves. Um, and then the last point, this is also new from the chapter. It specifically addresses eyeglasses. You know, there have been studies done that show people how many, how often people touch their eyeglasses throughout the day, either just sort of adjusting them on the bridge of the nose or, you know, pulling them off. So it's really important that you develop a procedure and, and define it in your SOP for having folks a procedure to disinfect those eyeglasses. As a best practice, contact recommends you only use disinfectant on the frames. <clears throat> Sometimes disinfectants or sterile alcohol could mess up the coatings on the lenses. So just use a lens cleaning wipe to clean the eyeglass lens itself. But you want to use a true disinfectant dis to disinfect the frames before you go and begin your garbing process. So we're going to go on and talk a little bit more now about the garbing process and specifically about hand hygiene. So again, anyone who enters a, a space to do category one, category two, or category three compounding needs to be properly trained on this hand hygiene process we're going to go through. The, tra the, tra the chapter specifically says you cannot use brushes. And they're talking about here, if you think of folks that might be going into an operating room, they'll, see, they'll have these individually packed sponges and each sponge may be impregnated with iodine or, or a hand cleaning uh, chemical. They'll have a nail pick sort of embedded right there. Those sponges have almost like a sandpaper, a scotch bright side, and that can exfoliate your skin, shedding lots of particles and fibers. So the chapter specifically forbids those brushes from being used. It also says you can't use hand dryers. These are those powered hand, hand dryers you see um, in public restrooms. Obviously, that would create airflow all throughout the room and could disturb how the clean room was actually working, trying to pass clean air from those HEPA filters and out there. Chapter also specifies that you can't use refillable soap containers. So if you have a, a pump soap container there at your sink, you need to make sure that, you know, once that soap is done, that bottle is getting thrown away. I'm not sort of opening a lid and trying to refill that. So you can't use any of those. If you look specifically at box three in the chapter, it lays out the hand washing process. The first bullet point I want to draw your attention to, clean underneath fingernails using warm running water using a disposable nail cleaner. This disposable nail cleaner is a, is, a, is a step I sometimes see skipped. They're like, oh, well, if I had dark dirt under my fingernails, I'd go ahead and clean it off. It, you know, dark dirt, white dirt, it all has the same amount of microorganisms living in it. So make sure you use that nail pick when you're doing that. And then the last thing I want to draw attention to in box three there is the last bullet point. Dry hands and forearms up to the elbows completely with low lint disposable towels or wipes. Low lint's a key word, so we can't have sort of those generic paper towels that you'd see in any commercial restroom. And you already saw above that hand dryers are specifically forbidden. So make sure you're looking for a low lint specific uh, towel that you can use for hand drying in that process. So the order of garbing depends on the placement of your sink. This is one of the biggest changes when it comes to this new chapter. The 2008 chapter basically said you need to don basically cleanest to dirtiest. It gave an example of sort of a such as it wasn't exactly prescribed. But the compounding expert committee really understands that the proper donning sequence that I would need to go through really does depend on the placement of my sink. If the sink is outside of my clean room, perhaps the sink is in my clean room, but it's on the, the dirty side of the LOD, or my sink is on the clean side of the line of demarcation. It's that placement of the sink that's really going to impact that garbing sequence. And so the chapter is going to leave it up to you. Um, they're going to, you need to define in your SOP what that gowning sequence is, and you're going to come up with that based on the placement of the sink. Um, we actually have some recommended best practices that we'll get into here just in a few minutes. Continue with on hand giant. This order of garbing must be documented in your SOP. It says that hands must be sanitized with 70 sterile percent uh, alcohol throughout the compounding day. 
in the past, I've seen lots of folks just literally take a spray bottle of alcohol and spray their hands. It takes a long time for your hands to dry, and you actually aren't actually egressing or removing any of that burden that may have been on your hands. So contact recommends as a best practice, you use a pre-saturated sterile alcohol wipe and actually wipe your hands down for that periodic rubbing of the, of the sterile gloves throughout the day with your 70% IPA. Chapter also says that you must don in a classified space or an SCA. So the donning these gloves must occur in a classified space. Um, the 2008 chapter said that you would don the sterile gloves after you entered the buffer room. So this is a, a slight change per the new chapter. You would be allowed to don those sterile gloves in either your ante or buffer room as long as it, it is a classified space. Box four here at the bottom of this chart, basically it just goes through the hand sanitization process. Box three was the hand washing process. Just basically saying you're applying an alcohol hand rub to your skin making sure you apply that rubbing your hands together, covering all surfaces, sort of getting down in all the crooks and crevices as you're applying that. And then you need to allow your hands to completely dry before you go ahead and don your sterile gloves. <clears throat> garbing requirements. So we'll talk about what the chapter requires for garbing. So any person who enters a compounding area where category one, two, or three drugs must be properly garbed. They must garb in an order that is determined by their SOP. We just talked about that a minute ago. Based on where your sink is, you'll need to put that into your SOP. Folks that are doing Category 2 and Category 3 compounding must don those garments in a classified space. So if you're doing Category 2 or Category 3, you've got to have a clean room, and you've got to don your garb inside of that classified space. It says that if you are... Uh, doing your hand hygiene outside of the clean room, then you need to make sure that you put alcohol hand rub on your hands before you start the garbing process. So just think about that. If my sink's outside the clean room and that's where I'm doing my hand hygiene and I've now entered the room, you need to apply that uh, uh, water-free alcohol hand rub on your hands before you begin the garbing process. Section 3.3, .3, garbing requirements. This is new in the chapter because it specifically says that skin must not be exposed in the ISO 5 class PEC. So the example they give is you don't want to doff your sterile gloves and have your exposed hands sitting in that PEC. But also if you notice in this picture right here, this guy who's cleaning that PEC is being very careful when he leans in with his hands to clean the sidewalls of that. But he's his he has exposed skin on his face. He's just got a mask and a bouffant on. So he would not want to sort of lean inside of that primary engineering control. So it's very specific that you can have no exposed skin whatsoever in an in a ISO 5 PEC. And that doesn't matter category one, category two, or category three. No exposed skin in your PEC. The chapter also says that donning and doffing cannot occur in the same place at the same time. And that makes sense if you think about the process of doffing. When someone takes off a garment, they're actually sort of shedding and sort of exploding particles. So you wouldn't want to have me doffing right here and my partner to come right in the room and he's donning into his clothes right there. You need to order, or, sort of separate those areas. If you don't have the space to do that, and I realize that, you just sort of need to pay attention and put that in your employee's head that, hey, if I'm sort of going into the room and someone's coming out, wait here a second, let them go ahead and come out of the room, doff out properly before I go in and start dar uh, donning my garb. So this is specific donning and doffing cannot occur in the same area at the same time. So let's talk about the minimum requirements for category one drugs. So category one and category two, there's a minimum garbing requirement. The word low lint here appears a lot. You know, USP has now adopted IEST's definition for low lint. In the past uh, 2008 chapter, there was non-shedding, lint-free. There was a lot of terminology that went around. So they've adopted this low lint definition, and they use it for virtually every one of these bullet points you'll see here. So this is the minimum requirement for category of one. First thing, obviously, is you need to have a low lint garment, low lint shoe covers, a low lint head cover for your bouffant, a low lint face mask, sterile powder-free gloves. And then the chapter talks about RABs. RABs are what we refer to back in, um, some people just nomenclature call it a glove box, but it's a CAI or a CACI. They're gonna be called RABs, Restricted Access Barrier Systems throughout this new chapter. 
So it says that if you're using a RABS unit, you need to have a disposable glove on your hands as you reach your hand into that gauntlet sleeve. Then you'll have the gauntlet sleeve enclosure, and then you must put a sterile glove over that gauntlet sleeve. And that sterile glove is what will be touching the drugs and working as you prepare those CSPs. So the chapter does specifically say for those folks that are doing RABS, you're kind of going to have a three-layer effect as you work through that gauntlet sleeve inside of that RABS unit. So when we get to category three, and it just bounced a little bit ahead of my there, here we go. Category three, this is what I talked about when we were first defining category one, category two, and category three. So category three comes with those increased rules. Because we're going to get the luxury of having the long, longer beyond use dating, there's extra things I'm going to have to follow. And it says that I've got to follow these rules at all times, regardless if I'm compounding category three drugs on any given day. So per scheduling, if I'm only going to be doing category three drugs on sort of one day of the month, I can't get away and just follow these extra rules on that one day. I've got to follow these extra rules the other 29, 28 days of the month. So all of these rules must be met at all times, regardless if you're cat, uh, compounding category three on that given day. So let's go through what some of these extra requirements are. First of all, you can't allow any exposed skin whatsoever in the buffer room itself. I just talked a moment ago about not having exposed skin in the ISO 5 primary engineering control. That's category one, two, or three. But for category three, you can't have exposed skin at all in the clean room. So if you notice the person of this picture garbing here, in some of the previous pictures I showed you, the person was wearing a traditional sort of bouffant style cap and a face mask, and there was lots of exposed skin. This person here is wearing a full head cover and then a face mask. That would be more appropriate for category three compounding, or they're going to need to be in a full bunny suit because it's very specific that there is going to be no exposed skin allowed anywhere inside the buffer room. Also, all of your garb must be sterile. This is a pretty significant change. If you are going into category three compounding, all of the garb, not just your gloves, your garments, hairnets, shoe covers, face covers, it all must be sterile. Your disposable items, you, they're going to just have to be disposed. There's no sort of reusing some of the PPE like you can do when you're doing category one and category three, two. Sometimes they're allowed to reuse their gown for one shift. That's not allowed in category three. All of that disposable garb is single use and throw it away. One of the new things also in this chapter, and you're going to need to be very specific about adding this into your SOP because it is a must. Your facility SOPs must describe a process for disinfecting shared equipment. So this is things like safety goggles that people might be wearing during a monthly clean, respirators if they're using a, you know, a sporicide and applying that during the month and they're wearing respirators. Any of that shared equipment, you must now develop an SOP for disinfecting those shared items. And it's got to be listed right in, in that protocol. So moving on, garbing requirements. Just some more general notes about garbing. Obviously, if your garb gets soiled, you need to replace it immediately. The chapter does talk specifically about how you're going to store your garb. You need to store it away, the, away from the sink. And you see in this picture here, they're using, and you can get these sort of entity home improvement store, these plastic containers to store their garb. They've got it several feet away. So there it's going to be uh, avoiding splashing or any contamination from that sick, uh, sink. So I mentioned a moment ago, folks that are doing category one and category two compounding are allowed to reuse their gown only for one shift. They have to maintain it in that classified space. So maybe as they're leaving their anteroom, there needs to be a hook there where they can keep that gown. They could take a lunch break, come back. They're going to be replacing their hairnet and their face mask and their shoe covers. But for category one and two, they are allowed to reuse that gown for one shift. As we showed you on the previous slide, category three, they're not. They've got to dispose it every time. None of that other garb can, can be reused when they were. So obviously when you're leaving, you can save your gown, but you got to get rid of your hairnet and your face mask and all of that. Let's talk a little bit about gloves and sterile gloving procedure. Obviously your gloves need to be sterile and powder free. A lot of times I'll go into facilities and I'll see folks, they've got sterile gloves, but they're actually sterile surgical gloves. 
you know, sterile clean room gloves are generally laid out in like I call it a, a long rectangular format and a sterile surgical glove is going to be packaged more of a square. You fold, you open the package and the gloves sort of fold out. The primary difference with those surgical gloves is the paper that's inside of that presentation packaging where the people's hands are going through their proper process to don sterile gloves. That paper inside a surgical glove creates lots of particles and fibers. So there is a true difference in a clean room sterile glove and a surgical sterile glove. The chapter only requires a sterile glove, but we recommend as a best practice, you certainly understand the difference in a clean room and a sterile surgical glove. You have to apply 70% IPA throughout, to your hands throughout the day in the compounding process. Um, and then RABS, you need to, if you've got a RABS unit, that CAI or that CAI, make sure you follow your uh, manufacturer's recommendation for how frequently you're going to disinfect those gauntlet sleeves, how you're going to get take care of that equipment. Make sure you rely on your manufacturer for that information. So let's talk about best practices for donning garb, category one and category two. I'm going to show you these slides, but I don't want to spend a ton of time. First of all, to let you know, this entire slide deck will be available for download at the end of today's presentation. Jacqueline's going to talk about it, and there will be a link given in the chat, and you'll be able to download these slides and these best practice recommendations. We're also going to make an entire webinar. We realize this actually needs a little bit more time than we can give it today. So I want to briefly talk about these with you, but then sort of promote our first webinar next year. So in first quarter of 2023, will be focused on these best practice donning scenarios based on the placement of your sink. And the first one here, if you see, is the sink on the clean side of your uh, line of demarcation. So we've got this first scenario. I'm going to show you two scenarios here. Both would be in a clean room suite. This first one is if you've got your sink on the clean or the far side of the line of demarcation. I would imagine that is what most of your pharmacies look like. We also will show you a scenario if you've got, you're still in a clean room, but that sink is on the dirty side of the line of demarcation. So this process should be pretty familiar to most people. We're going to start by visiting the restroom. We're going to tie our hair back, clean our eyeglasses. Once we come in that ante room, we're going to start at the top, put on our head cover and our face mask. Then we'll sit down on our gowning bench, put our booties on one foot at a time as we cross the line of demarcation. We'll go and perform hand hygiene. At that point, we can uh, hit the sink, you know, full washing our hands and up to our elbows for 30 seconds. At that point, we put on our gown. Then we use our waterless alcohol-based hand rub before donning our sterile gloves. Slightly different scenario here if we talk about our sink on the dirty side of the line of demarcation. On one of my earlier slides when I was talking with garbing requirements, it said that if your sink was located outside of the clean room or on that dirty side, then you needed to apply that alcohol-based hand rub just before applying your gown. And if you see that, this list of eight steps is really, there's just one difference in these two columns, and that's number five. So if we walk through this process, we start the same way. We visited the restroom, tied our hair back. We've entered the anteroom, and we've donned our face mask and our hairnet. Then we put our booties on one foot at a time across the line of demarcation. Because now we would, there's no sink to perform hand hygiene, at this point we need to apply the alcohol-based hand rub to our hands before we don that gown. Then we can apply alcohol-based hand rub again to our hands before we don surgical, uh, surgical gloves. One of the other scenarios that we'll be able to have available to you is if you've got your sink completely outside of the clean room. So what you saw before was sink on the dirty side of the LOD. This scenario that we've got here is the sink outside of the clean room. Primary difference here is a lot more steps of applying alcohol hand sanitizer. So if my sink's outside, I'm obviously step number two here. I'm performing that right at the beginning. I'm performing hand hygiene before I walk into my clean room space. Enter the ante room, apply that alcohol-based hand rub. Then I can put on my hairnet and my face mask. I can put on my shoe covers. Then I need to apply alcohol-based hand rub again before I don my gown. And then for a third time, I'll place alcohol-based hand rub before I don those sterile gloves. So again, you see here how that placement of the sink is the most critical to helping you determine this sequence. Again, these slides and these best practice sequence recommendations will be available for download, and we'll be doing a webinar 
in 2023 to further break these down. Segregated compounding areas, depending on whether your sink is located inside the room in which the SCA is located or the sink is located outside of the room in which the SCA is located, um, we've got these two sequences here. This again is primarily folks doing category one because this is going to be in an SCA. Um, the previous slide is category two. That's where when we took our poll earlier in this webinar where most of the folks um, efforts were made. Sinks. Let's talk for a minute about sinks because the chapter specifically addresses them in section 4.4 about water sources. It says that sinks should be hands-free. So if you're doing a remodeling project, go ahead and spec in and, and uh, install a hands-free sink. You know, anytime people are manipulating faucets and things like that, it's just more opportunity for their hands to come in touch with bio burden. So it is a should for applying a hands-free sink. You need to clean and disinfect the surfaces of the sink daily and apply a sporicidal at least monthly. So we're going to do make sure we put into our protocols that we clean that sink daily. I would also maybe when you're training folks on that, teach them to pay particular attention to the drain. The drains really are, you know, that's where some of the moisture lives and that is where an opportunity for something to grow. So take a little bit extra time when you're scrubbing around or, or pouring disinfectant around that drain area. But you must do a sporicide at least monthly in that sink. Chapter specifically says that the sink can be placed on the clean side or the dirty side of the line of demarcation, but that definitely will impact your downing, your dawning sequence is the placement of that sink. Let's talk about training requirements. So earlier in the chapter, I mentioned the training requirements were sort of different for those that were involved with compounding or had direct oversight of compounding. So there it really has some prescribed testing like the media field testing and the frequency of glove fingertip testing. But for cleaning staff, it basically says you need to develop these SOPs. You're responsible for implementing these. So context here, this is where we can really assist and come out and help you and your staff get trained up to the best practice levels. Just because it's been less prescriptive in this version of the chapter doesn't give you the opportunity to come back. And it's actually, it's a great opportunity for you. It's not so much of a, a challenge to have to write these SOPs. They're, they're giving you this opportunity to come up with work, what works for you and what works for your staff. So first of all, anyone who enters a space to be clean room, whether it be your staff, or your EVS that are personnel must be properly garbed. They must have been trained on the full garbing procedure. They must have been trained on all the principles for how you sort of maintain that clean room environment. You've got to put your approved disinfectants in your SOPs, especially if you've got folks coming in from environmental services. Services They may be used to using a different chemistry in other areas of the hospital, maybe even something from concentrate. So you need to make sure that they have it, you have it defined clearly in your SOP which disinfectant they're going to be using. You need to have it defined clearly in that SOP, the frequency that you're going to be cleaning, the locations that you're going to be cleaning. All of this needs to be in your um, standard operating procedures. They need to know their dwell times. If an inspector walks in and holds up a bottle of chemistry and shows it to any one of your pharmacy staff or someone from EVS that might be there cleaning, they need to immediately know what the contact times are for each of those chemistries. And that's really going to come down to that DP, that designated person, and the training program that they have created and implemented. <clears throat> so I really want to talk to you here about what this is a where the CEC had an intent, and they've really taken the time in Section 7 here to break out the difference in cleaning, disinfecting, and sporicide. You know, the word sporicide or sporicidal doesn't even appear in the 2008 chapter. It does not exist. When we saw some of the drafts in like 2017, the proposed revision in 2019, proposed revision in 2021, sporicide application was there. So we all knew it was coming, but that word didn't even exist. So I think they really just want from the most basic level, the CEC wants us to understand that there is a difference in cleaning. So cleaning is essentially just removing soil and then disinfecting is the process of actually destroying micro microorganisms and then spores actually, you know, we kill spores. It is actually killing a, a killing a spore. Box nine, or excuse me, table nine in the chapter sort of breaks this out a little bit further. I've always used that old adage that you can clean without disinfecting, but you can't disinfect without cleaning. 
And oftentimes you'll see talk, talk about people taking a pre-cleaning step to, before they apply a disinfectant. And that was, that was really a part of this breakdown, clean, disinfect, and then there's a sporicidal application. As we'll talk about in a minute, there are EPA registered one step cleaner disinfectants that make that pre-cleaning step not necessary because just applying that one step cleaner disinfectant is gonna do both clean and disinfect in the same step. So depending on the chemistry you're using, you could turn this into two tasks instead of those uh, distinct three definitions that the chapter has broken out for you. Residue removal. So when we talk about using any disinfectant inside of our primary engineering control, that comes with the most frequently required application of disinfectant in our pharmacy. We're cleaning our floors every day, we're cleaning our walls once a month, but we're cleaning that PEC throughout the day. So the, the compounding expert committee is aware that you could have residue build up there if you were just constantly applying disinfectants and never removing the residue. This did exist in 2008, so this isn't anything that's new, but you must uh, remove residue after applying sterile IPA inside any pr uh, primary engineering control. You're also gonna use uh, IPA um, before you start compounding as a sanitizer. So before I begin compounding, I'm gonna use it as a sanitizer, and then I'm gonna use it as a residue removal after I uh, apply my disinfectants. I wanna call some special attention to these next two bullet points because it is one of the biggest changes here in the chapter and it has to do with the frequency of applying that sterile IPA throughout the day when I'm compounding. Previously, the 2008 chapter said that I needed to disinfect that PEC using sterile IPA in between every CSP, so in between every prep, um, no longer than 30 minutes of compounding. So it said I needed to stop if 30 minutes had passed, stop what I was doing, sort of push my supplies out of the way, clean and disinfect the PEC, and then resume compounding. The new chapter completely changes that. It basically says during the compounding process, 70% IPA must be applied to the horizontal work surface. So that's the first change. Previous chapter was the entire PEC. Now they're saying it's just that deck, the horizontal work surface of the PEC. You're gonna apply 70% IPA at least every 30 minutes if the process takes 30 minutes or less. If the process takes more than 30 minutes, don't stop compounding, don't stop what you're doing, continue making that prep. And once you get done with that, immediately you can do your surface disinfection of just the work surface of that PEC. So again, those sort of those quick changes are, it's no longer the entire PEC in between every prep. It's really focused just on our work surface of the PEC. And that 30 minutes is sort of a big change. Also, this information used to be in, uh, incorporated into table 10, was called table eight in the previous generation. But this is the chart that breaks out our minimum cleaning frequencies for all the thing. And if we could go full screen here. Thank you. Let you guys, these words are a little bit smaller, give you the opportunity to read these. So again, if you actually notice those two bullet points I just showed you talking about the 30 minutes, that language used to appear inside of table 10. It is now sort of embedded in a paragraph above table 10. Just sort of note that you really do need to pay attention and, and read all of the paragraphs because some of the stuff that was neatly broken out in the charts before is now sort of buried in those paragraphs. But this chart sort of starts at the top with our primary engineering control. This is another big change. It says equipment and all interior surfaces of the PEC daily on days when compounding occurs. So that's another change. In 2008, it had to do it every single day regardless if they were compounding that day. So all throughout table 10, but the cleaning and disinfecting says that this equipment must be done daily on days when compounding occurs. And obviously if surface contamination is known or suspected. If we look over at the far, far right, the column for applying sporocidal disinfectants, this is one of those big changes we talked about at the beginning, depending on if you're doing category one, category two, or category three, your application requirements of sporocide are different. So inside the PEC, you must apply a, a sporicide monthly if you're doing category one and category two, and you must do it weekly if you're doing category three. Contact is always recommended as a best practice that you apply a sporicide weekly in every PEC, regardless of category one, category two, or category three. 
And Contech will maintain that going forward as a best practice going beyond this minimum standard that you apply a, a sporicide weekly in all PECs. But for other areas of the room, if you, as you scroll down and you talk about our pass-throughs and our work surfaces outside of the PEC, so that's countertops and things like that. Again, that is monthly for category one and category two. But if they're doing category three compounding, it is required that they do a weekly application of a sporicide on their work surfaces, their pass-throughs, and the work surfaces and all sort of surfaces of their PEC. When we get down to talking about walls, ceilings, storage shelves, and bins, any of the equipment outside of the PEC, that is a monthly cleaning requirement, both our cleaning, disinfecting, and applying the sporicidal disinfectant. Talk real quickly about cleaning agents. This is sort of one of the biggest changes from a contact perspective and the products that we're out there training things for people to do. So this is new, whether you're category one, category two, or category three. All compounders must now use sterile disinfecting agents inside of the PEC. If you are using a disinfectant or alcohol, sterile alcohol inside of your PEC, it's got to be sterile. So this is a big change. Previously, we only had to use sterile alcohol, but we could use non-sterile disinfectants, both our germicidal or our sporicidal. But we are now required, this is a must, it's not a should. You really need to, when you're reading the chapter, understand the, the differences in those musts and should. This is a must. Cleaning, disinfecting, and sporocidal agents must be sterile. If you're doing something from a concentrate, hopefully you're not. Best practice would be to use ready-to-use chemistry. But if you are using any dilutions, you need to ensure that you're using sterile water when you mix that up. Chapter also says that in areas outside of the PEC, sterile cleaning agents should be used. So we've gone from a must to a should. So in the PEC, you must use sterile disinfecting agents. Outside of the PEC, in the clean room itself, it is a should for using uh, sterile agents. If any of you had the opportunity to attend the stakeholder open forums that the CEC had back in that comment period when people were asking questions and engaged with the CEC, they addressed this and they said sort of their intent was not to introduce any new bio burden into that SEC. But I, you know, from my perspective, if as you as the pharmacist, this is where you need to arm yourself with data, lots of environmental monitoring. If you were able to prove through success, lots of environmental monitoring that you have maintained a state of control using non-sterile cleaning agents inside that SEC, that could be a good answer for any inspector. But again, that is a should, not a must, and it's up, for you, it's up to you to determine based on your risk assessment and the needs of your facility whether or not you're going to implement that sterile disinfectant inside of the SEC itself. And it adds another note, again, SEC, if you're using dilutable uh, disinfectants from concentrate, it's got to be mixed using sterile water. <clears throat> so we talked about cleaning agents. Let's talk about supplies. We'll hear that. We'll see that word low lent saying all supplies must be low lent, obviously, except for your, your handle and things like that. All, also, all supplies must be sterile. This is another big change in the chapter. So Previous 2008, only the, the alcohol that we used had to be sterile, not the wipe, not the disinfectant. Now, the disinfectant and the wipe, or if you're using an easy reach tool like you see in the picture here, that applicator pad must be sterile. As a best practice, for many years, Contact has been recommending that people use sterile wipes inside the PEC anyway. So the chapter is sort of catching up to where our best practice recommendations were. The tools themselves, that handle doesn't need to be sterile, but it must be cleaned and disinfected before and after each use. And then those white pads and mops, the chapter says that those should be disposable. So one use on those, and then you're going to throw away that wipe or that pad. So some pretty big changes there when it comes to our cleaning agents and our cleaning supplies, spe specifically around sterility, that being a must when it comes to the primary engineering control. A little bit more about supplies. Obviously, the, uh, we talked about it just a minute ago. You need to make sure you in, uh, institute a process and then inspect to make sure your employees are doing this, that they clean those tools before and after each use. We've got the easy reach tool picture here. 
But the same thing would go for a, a stainless steel mop handle that I would be using to clean walls or floors. Those tools need to be cleaned and disinfected uh, before and after every use. Tools have to be dedicated for a space that they're used in and stay in that space. Chapter says they're only removed for disposal. So I've got a cleaning tool that I'm using inside of my PEC. I don't want to then take that out of the PEC and go you know, clean behind the shelves in my ante room. If I've got a mop handle that's in my HD compounding room, I don't want to take that mop handle and bring it out into my non-hazardous side. So you need to make sure that your mop tools and all those handles stay in the area where they're going to be used. Add a process to frequently inspect your tools. I've gone into some facilities for and seen mop handles that are showing signs of corrosion um, and are falling apart. So make sure you inspect that hardware and replace it as needed. And the last thing on this slide I want to talk about is the chapter does address sterile wipes. <clears throat> you know, here at Contact, we get the question often. We've got you know, the sterile pre-saturated alcohol wipes. People say, well, how long is that sterile, you know, once I open it? Well, technically it's not sterile um, once you open it. And we, we did a webinar about this earlier this year. So I invite you to visit Contact Healthcare. You can take a deeper dive on this. So we had to do an entire webinar to sort of help address this, this question that folks had. So we're glad now that the chapter is included in part of this. And the chapter says, indeed, you may continue using that pack. In other words, you don't have to open the pack, take out one wipe and throw it away. It says you may continue using that pack, listen to the recommendations of your manufacturer, but document it in your SOP. And here I'm gonna say, come up with a use by date on a pack of pre-saturated wipes, depending on the volume of your facility, you could say seven or 14 days. That's your protocol. I'm gonna write that uh, use by date on that pack of alcohol wipes and make sure I use those before that date. So the chapter now specifically does, it says you may reuse those packs, but you need to talk with your manufacturer and come up with a protocol, write that in your SOP and then make sure your employees are following that. So I wanna go to full slide here if we can, Daniel, so you can sort of see the letters on box seven and box eight. This is where the chapter breaks out the procedures for cleaning and disinfecting and applying sporicidal disinfectants. I'm just gonna sort of ask us to, to take bullet point one and sort of put it out of our brains. Just a few minutes ago, I talked about you may need to do a pre-cleaning step. So if your disinfectant is not a one-step cleaner disinfectant, you're going to need to do that pre-clean step before you apply the disinfectant. But when we're re reading bullet point two, it says that if you are using a one-step cleaner disinfectant, that first step is not necessary. So, But I wanted to point out in this chart, and that's why I asked them to make it full screen, the second bullet point. And that is, again, here we're stressing this is a significant change, that it is a must requirement using a sterile low lint wiper, apply a sterile cleaning agent, followed by a sterile EPA registered disinfectant or an EPA registered one step cleaner disinfectant to all surfaces. You need to make sure you achieve that contact time. We're always worried about dwell times. Employees need to know the dwell or contact time for any chemistry that they're using. And then bullet point four, using a sterile low lint wipe, apply sterile 70% IPA to all equipment interior surfaces of the PEC. You've got to allow the surfaces to dry before you resume compounding. Box eight, and we'll leave it on full screen here. Thank you, Daniel. This is the same exact step. Those bullet points should look very familiar to you, except instead of applying a disinfectant, we're applying a sporicidal disinfectant. So again, bullet point one, mic button is not necessary because you're using a one-step cleaner disinfectant sporicide with Paradox. So again, if you look at bullet point two, we need to apply that sterile sporicidal agent using sterile low lint wipers to all surfaces. When we get down to bullet point four, using a sterile low lint wipe, apply sterile 70% IPA to all interior surfaces, including the work tray underneath, and allow the services to dry completely before compounding begins. So we can come back to, to me here on the screen. I wanted to pull these boxes out of the chapter. Again, those are very familiar, but just to stress, you know, this is such a big change, having the must on these sterile products inside of our PEC. But other than that, the procedure is not really gonna change. You're always cleaning a PEC, cleanest to dirtiest. So we'll start cleaning the ceiling and the back walls. We'll make sure our clean our IV bar and the hangers, we clean our sidewalls, 
clean the deck of the PEC. So the sequence is not going to change from anything in 2008. It's the products that we're using to do that procedure that are going to have sort of the biggest change. <clears throat> so last thing we're going to close up here, sort of our big umbrella. We talked about training. We've talked about garbing requirements. We've talked about cleaning and disinfecting. But now there's an own, its own section in the chapter for introducing items into the PEC and the SEC. Those used to sort of just be embedded in different parts of the chapter in different paragraphs. Now they're, stand, they're a standalone section. So 8.1 specifically introduces, uh, has to do with introducing items to the SEC before you take items into the clean room. And basically it says before you introduce any item to the clean room, you need to wipe it. And it gives you a choice. It says you can wipe it with a disinfectant, you can wipe it with sterile IPA, or you can wipe it with a sporicide. Context strongly recommends as a best practice that you use a sporicide for this. A lot of the items that get shipped in the uh, healthcare facilities were shipped in cardboard boxes. And we know from repeated studies that corrugated cardboard can host lots of spores and that can help introduce those into healthcare facilities. So by using a sporicide for this step, before I take an item into my SEC, I'm helping, that's a best practice, I'm helping make sure I address that. You need to make sure you pay particular attention to the dwell time on whatever you're doing. And if you're only going to use alcohol, if you're gonna, not going to follow our best practice and you're going to use sterile alcohol for wiping items going into the clean room, you need to allow the sterile IPA to dry and you need to ensure that it doesn't mess up the labeling. So you can't smear or damage any of the packaging if you choose to use IPA for this introducing items into the SEC. Section 8.2 has to do specifically with introducing items to the PEC and to our primary engineering control. And for this, it's a must. You must use 70% sterile IPA. I no longer have the luxury or the choice of using a disinfectant, a sporicide, or alcohol. If I'm introducing an item into the PEC, I must use sterile IPA. The chapter does acknowledge that there are a lot of manufacturers that can provide you products that are double packaged. There's a, there's a shrink wrap, sort of outer wrap, and those are designed to help get the inner packaging, the sterile packaging, into your sterile environment. So if you have received a product like that with the double packaging, the chapter specifically addresses it and says you don't need to then wipe it before taking that item into the PEC. And as always, just make sure whatever you're doing doesn't render the product label uh, unreadable because at that point, the person who's going to be compounding that medication isn't going to know what they're dealing with. Last thing in section is 8.3 deals specifically with critical site wipes. And it says that critical site, the critical sites must be wiped with 70% sterile IPA. So this is a must with alcohol to provide chemical and mechanical action. You know, oftentimes I've gone to facilities and I call them the, the rib wipes, those individual alcohol packs. You know, those weren't designed for a clean room environment. They were really designed for, for skin asepsis, you know, wiping your arm before you, before you get a shot. So the fabric that's in that wipe is not appropriate, certainly for an ISO 5 environment. You're also creating sort of lots of, lots of trash as you open each of those packages. So Contact does have a product called Critical Site Wipes that are sort of specifically designed for this new section 8.3 um, with critical sites. So this is a must, and you need to make sure you add this and your SOPs. Well, I want to thank you for your time today. We've really sort of tried to, to take you a broad overview of these uh, four umbrellas of hygiene uh, and garbing, personnel training, cleaning and disinfecting, and then that movement of materials into and out of a clean room. The main things I want you to sort of take away if you can today, go home and make sure you've got an assigned designated person and that person is going to be responsible for designing and creating that training program and then implementing it. You must use sterile products in your PEC. You should use sterile products in your SEC. You have to determine your own dawning sequence based on the placement of your sink. Contact can give you some best practice recommendations, but it's up to you to create that sequence and to place it inside of your protocol, as well as wiping dimes going down into the PEC and the SEC. That's its own section now. They specifically called out a procedure for disinfecting goggles or respirators, any of the equipment that might be reused. So if you do that first thing, assigning the DP, they can certainly help work you through that task. I want to really thank you guys for paying attention today. Again, we were just sort of focused on those four broad and uh, 
broad umbrellas of cleaning and disinfecting, personnel training, uh, hand hygiene and garbing, and then movement of materials. But there's a lot of stuff in this chapter. So please make sure you take the time to read the entire chapter. Thank you again. And I'm going to pass it off now to Rachel Hansen. Thank you for that wealth of information and knowledge, Michael. Hi, my name is Rachel Hansen, and I'm the marketing manager for Contact Healthcare. We appreciate so many of you taking the time to submit questions for today's event. And because of your tremendous engagement, we will host a follow-up webinar to address the questions we won't be able to get today. We're posting a link to register for this webinar in the chat box right now. So join us in December, where we will be including industry thought leaders into the conversation. We know how important it is for you to understand these published standards as you implement these changes into your compounding pharmacies. Also coming up in December, the ASHP Mid-Year Clinical Meeting and Exhibition in Las Vegas. Contact Healthcare will be at booth 523. And if you plan on attending ASHB, we'd love to meet you and answer your questions. Additionally, our lead microbiologist, Dr. Mark Weinsek, will be giving a professional poster presentation. Now back to Jacqueline and the rest of the team for our Q&A panel. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Michael, for the great information today. You're welcome. I am joined here today with the experts from the Contech team. So I'm gonna go through and introduce them, but I do wanna let you know, we realize we're at time. Michael had so much information to present. And so we want to let you know that this will be recorded and shared out. And so if you need to drop off, we understand, but we're gonna keep um, going with our panel discussion. And so just remember, if you have questions, put those in the chat. We've seen a lot of great questions come in. We've got a few we'll go through today. We will have the webinar next month and we'll have resources online for you as well. So let's jump into the panel. So I'd like to introduce Rachel Davidson, product manager. We all know Michael Myers. We have our senior product manager, Kate R. Patel, and we have our lead microbiologist, Mark Weinsek. So thank you panel for joining today. So let's jump in. So Michael, again, thank you for all the information. You covered a lot of material. And this is really a two-part question. So first, what do you think is the biggest change in the new chapter? And because you're responsible for training here at Contech, what's one major update that you're going to be needing to make in our training classes? Yeah, I mean, uh, the kind of the same answer to both questions. It's really that focus on the changes in cleaning the PEC. So we've, you know, we've developed training videos and task sheets. And when people come here for training, I, I work with them a lot to really hands-on go through that process of um, not just the materials they're using you know the new requirements around sterility but that process we're only focused now on the deck um the 30 minutes so that is really i think where i'm going to have the most work to now go and do is in, in touching all of these other training materials i've made is with that change great thank you michael and thank you for all the work that you do thanks all right, I'm gonna shift over to you, Kadar. So as our product manager, what do you think is the biggest impact, product speaking, um, from the new chapter? Oh, Michael just mentioned it, you know, sterile in the PEC by far. Uh, we have a complete line of wipes, pre-saturated wipes, uh, as well as our the disinfectants, which will now have to have a, a sterility assurance level of 10 to the minus six. So sterile in the PEC is, is critical. Uh, a lot of people are probably wondering if Preempt uh, Plus is going to have a sterile version because that's a very successful product. Uh, unfortunately, that technology does not lend itself to being sterilized uh, just because of the inert ingredients and in the formulation that it is. However, we do have them covered with what we call the Contact Healthcare TB1 3300. That's available in solution as well as wipes sterile. Great. That's very good to know. Thank you, Kadar. Mm -hmm. All right, Rachel, coming over to you. So the chapter has uh, significantly increased the requirement for applying sporocytals. Mm -hmm. Can you detail the garbing requirements and recommendations for working with sporocytal disinfectants? So that's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, for any chemistry, uh, the end user is gonna wanna check the SDS. The SDS is gonna highlight those things that are needed. So for our sporocytal paradox, uh, it highlights that you need goggles and that are eye covering, eye protection, and gloves. But I know a lot of people, they are concerned with the respiratory uh, effects of Paradox, the, the acetic acid. 
And the SDS, it, it states that some people may have issues with that. So it's really going to lend itself to the sensitivity of the user. So if, um, and also as uh, dealing with the SDS, people need to look at their own SOPs, your organization's SOPs and follow those. But we have documents stating the, um, stating best practices to use Paradox. The overuse of Paradox is something that you don't want. That's going to lend itself to a larger impact of, of the uh, vapors. But we also have documents here where we outline how you can mitigate uh, exposure to vapors and people can reach, uh, reach out to us and we can definitely give them that information um, and help them out. Awesome. Thank yeah. you, Rachel. That's an important clarification. So I appreciate you going through that. All right, Mark. Over to you. So the new chapter says sporicidal disinfectants are used to kill bact bacterial and fungal spores. So do we have to use a sporicidal to kill fungi? Okay, uh, I'm gonna try to give a concise answer here. I, I would <laughs> say the answer is no. On most uses and most fungi, uh, it, you're still gonna use a daily disinfectant that has broad spectrum coverage bacteria, fungi, even viruses, though we don't measure for those in environmental monitoring. So when folks register these, these disinfectants with the EPA as a fungicide, they do test against fungal spores. Now, are there some fungal spores that might be harder to kill than vegetative forms of fungi? There might be. And if you hit environmental monitoring dictates it, maybe increased frequency of sporicidal will be necessary. But I'm afraid I think, you know, USP kind of went with the definition that sits with the FDA about how a sporicide is defined. And again, when sporicides are registered, they're only tested against bacterial spores, which are known to be the hardest form of organisms to kill. Great. Thank you, Mark. So glad that we have you on board to walk through all that technical detail. So thank you for that. And Michael, I'm going to come back over to you. Good. Can you walk us through the cleaning of segregated compounding areas, please? Yeah. Um, so this is one that I think actually does definitely deserve some some attention because I think for some reason people think, oh, if I have an SCA, I, I don't have to do as much. I don't have a clean room, so I don't have to do as much. I put I asked them to take me off the screen earlier and go full size on table 10 from the new chapter. Pay attention to table 10. The title of that table is the minimum frequencies for applying disinfectants, cleaning and sporocytes in classified areas and the SCA. So there is no difference to the chapter, whether they've got a clean room suite or an SCA and the requirements for cleaning and frequencies for cleaning the ceiling or excuse me, cleaning the walls and floors in the PEC. The only difference is for the ceiling and a footnote C, actually he's got that up on the screen. I think it might be cut off. There you go. The ceilings of the SCA are required to be cleaned and applied only when visibly soiled because they realize if you're an SCA, you probably don't have a sealed ceiling. So you don't want to be sticking a mop up there every single day. But the title of that table is classified areas and the SCA. So that's a great question. Someone asked if you've got an SCA, you still have the same cleaning requirements with one exception, the ceiling uh, the, as anyone who has a clean room. Great. Thank you, Michael. All right. We're going to go out remotely to Melanie Dory. So Melanie is joining us from Canada. Hey, Melanie. Good to see you there. Hello. Melanie is a subject matter expert in sterile compounding. She's also a co-owner of Critical Compounding Resources. So we've asked her to come in and weigh in on how this impacts the Canadian compounding market. So Melanie. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Uh, I definitely can speak to that as I'm a pharmacy technician here in Canada. So uh, what I wanna start off with is just explaining a little bit how Canada, we don't follow USP. We have our own uh, national uh, compounding standards, which are called NAPRA model standards. So that is our federal uh, guidelines, sorry, our federal requirements that we need to follow. Now, what happens is each province or territory will decide whether to adopt the NAPRA model standards or if they'll uh, create their own. For example, Quebec is a province that have their own sterile compounding standards called Or des Pharmaciens. Now, when it comes to USP, um, we definitely use that more as a reference. Um, and then again, a lot of the model standards, like the NAPRA model standards, were definitely written based more on the 2008 version of USP 797. There's definitely some similarities there. So having these new, um, this new version of the chapter out 
definitely gives us a great reference document. For example, let's say that we have someone that is taking part in non-sterile to sterile compounding here in Canada. Well, our cur current NAPRA model standards don't really go into much detail about what would need to be done or what needs to happen in order to um, have a, uh, an incredibly high quality um, or expect a high quality in our um, in our facilities, in our compounding operations. So if we reference USP with all the talk of category threes and the increase and the focus on quality, we're able to use that as a reference and, and implement that in some of our compounding stat standards. Of course, you'd always want to check with your provincial or territorial um, college of pharmacy and make sure that the inspectors um, definitely support these changes if you are going down that route. So basically the answer is that it does become a reference document for us. Um, it doesn't really hold any jurisdiction or jurisdiction over our Canadian um, model standards or NAPRA model standards, but definitely a great reference document and with a great focus on quality, which is always uh, good to implement in any compounding yeah, facility anywhere in the world. That's wonderful. Thank you, Melanie. And I see you've got that book kill shot behind you. So that's an awesome resource. If, if you are watching and haven't read that book, that would be a great one to check out. So Melanie, thank you so much for joining us remotely. And we hope to Thank see you, you soon. All right, Michael, I know there were some chat questions that yeah. came in and you've got a lot of them there. So you I guys think you engagement want is, is absolutely amazing. Um, first of all, and as Jacqueline mentioned, we had hundreds of questions just as people registered. Do you have any questions? Um, and that's why we've decided to hold this second webinar in December because there's no way we'd have time to get to them. But then during live during the webinar, I got handed right from over there talking a list of questions. We're going to push a lot of these to, to that December webinar, but someone specifically said, must the fingernails be kept under running water during the whole nail cleaning step? My SOP requires wetting with soap and water first, then using a nail cleaner, then rinsing. Um, you'll need to change your SOP because if you look at that box at, um, from the chapter um, specifically about the hand washing sequence, it says that you must, using warm running water, hold your hands under there using a disposable nail pick. So that will, you'll need to do that picking directly under that. And I promise everyone, these are great questions. We're going to make them a part of that December follow-up. Great. Thank you, Michael. So we will do one more question and this one's for you. How is Contact going to support pharmacies implementing these changes? Stay tuned is all I can say. Clearly everything we've done is going to change. We've got lots of training videos that we've built over the years, task sheets that help folks. All of our catalogs, our lit sheets, our contact you, our online learning platform, it's all going to need to be touched. Um, we obviously have one year till November 1st of 2023 till it's enforceable. We're not going to wait that long. So stay tuned, um, stay in touch. Let us know what you need. But we're going to start with the priorities. So we're going to start with PECs, floors, sort of those things that people are doing every single day. And the video for cleaning storage bins, we'll probably you know, put that towards the back burner, but it'll all be coming. So stay tuned. Very good. Well, thank you panelists for joining. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Melanie, for joining us in. And I want to thank all of you that have joined us today online. At Contech, we are committed to a customer first approach and bringing you the most effective solutions to prevent harm. So as we've said, this webinar will be available shortly to watch shortly to watch on demand. We've also created a special USP webpage where today's slides are available for download. And Rachel's putting that link into the chat. The page has everything you need to know about how Contech will partner with you to work and implement the changes mentioned today. I also wanna thank our multimedia team. Thank you guys. This wouldn't be possible, and there they are. This wouldn't be possible without them. So thank you so much for putting this together. And we look forward to having you join us in December. And thanks for hanging on and going over a little bit of time with us. See you next time.
Thank <laughs> you.